Okej, okay. uh, tack. Jag känner mig väldigt uh, stöttad uh, och supported. Jag kommer att switcha över till engelska nu. Min presentation är på engelska. So from now on it's going to be English all the way. Uh, my name is Albertina Sperhult. Uh, today I am here to talk a little bit about an initi initiative called Diversi that I am working for. Uh, that's wrong. Why is it doing this now? Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. No. This. Let's see. Yes. Today I'm here to talk a bit about DVC, which is the organization that I'm working for. I'm also going to talk quite a bit about diversity and the games industry. Uh, and I'm also going to tell you a, a story uh, about myself, which is going to take up the most space uh, uh, of this presentation, actually. So, uh, hello. <laughs> this is a cow. This, this is another cow. Uh, and. Uh, I am a person that grew up on the countryside. My first best friend in life was a cow, a calf. I was there uh, and uh, being a part of uh, delivering him into the world. His name was Totte. I uh, brought him with me on all my explorations. I loved exploring as a kid. I also brought him indoors. <laughs> uh, and he took a crap on our living room floor. My mom was not pleased. Uh, this is actually not Totte, this is a random uh, calf from the internet, but you get the picture. As I said, when I was a kid I loved exploring and I had a, a big imagination. I played a lot alone and, and sort of explored the surroundings at the farm where I lived. I was kind of a weird kid. That's me in the center. These are my friends. This is my friend Elna. I'm not sure what she's dressing up as. I think it might be that she's dressing up as an old man, but I'm not sure, it's a bit... Uh, I wasn't the only weird kid in, in our class. Um, I was the kind of person who loved adventure and stories and fairy tales. I was the kind of kid that climbed into my wardrobe uh, expecting to find Narnia at the back of the wardrobe closet. I never did, which made me really, really sad. Uh, I spent time crying because I never found uh, Narnia in my wardrobe. Um, but, but yeah, that, uh, that was the kind of kid that, that I was. Uh, when I uh, grew older, my uh, interest uh, for exploration uh, also led me to study here at Gotland, uh, at uh, what was then called uh, Högskolan på Gotland where you also study, study, and that's partially why I'm here today, uh, getting the opportunity to talk to you guys. I studied here. Um, I also worked for freelance for a while, um, started my own company and did work on commission. It went so-so. Uh, we had some very nice projects uh, going for a while. Um, but after that, I, I got tired and I decided to go uh, to Iceland and build spaceships. And I did that for a year. Uh, it was a very interesting experience and um, my presentation today is, is pretty wide, it's going to cover quite a few different things. So if at any point you want to ask me about something or during the Q&A uh, in the end, you can ask me about this or, or any of the other things that I bring up. So you can try and remember the stuff that I've been talking about. I worked as a designer uh, on EVE for a year, uh, which was a great experience. Um, and. Um, but besides from all, all of this and, and my career in, in the gaming industry, I am above all uh, a gamer. So I've been playing games since I was a little kid. Uh, the first game that I got on a console was... Um, <laughs> what? What is it called? Ice Climber, yeah. I actually played this game when I had the flu. I played it so much that I got sick. I can't play it anymore till this day because I feel like throwing up each time I see this screen. I'm not gonna throw up right now. Uh, I played a lot of games. This is basically my, uh, my growing up, 
that you see. Uh, you probably recognize some of these. I'm probably a bit older than some of you, so um, I played a lot of Tekken. Um, so this is the kind of culture that I've been immersing myself with uh, since I was little, since I was about six years old. I, I love this one. I don't know if any of you have played the uh, Trudvang um, Dungeon and Dragons episode, but it's really, really great. I highly recommend it. Nowadays, I play mostly online. I play a lot of Dota 2, and I play a lot of World of Warcraft. But uh, let's rewind a bit to 2007. In 2007, I was studying at this school. We had a project called Fairy Tale, which had won some awards and stuff like that. It felt really awesome. And we were going to Leipzig to attend what was then called uh, the GCDC. I don't even remember what that stands for, but today it is called the GDC Europe, and it's no longer in Leipzig, it is in Cologne instead. Has any of you been to the GDC? A couple? Yes. Uh, it's a nice event. There's also uh, the Gamescom, which take place at the same time. Uh, I was going there together with my little group of friends. This is us. We were very proud uh, and very excited to be going to this amazing conference. We sat up all night at the hotel room uh, trying to fix our game that we were exhibiting because, of course, it was broken. <laughs> we didn't get much sleep that night. Uh, so we come to the, the conference. Uh, Håkan was there, by the way. He was not in our hotel room, but he was present. Um, <laughs> Marcus as well. Um, so, uh, the next day uh, we go to the conference and it's full of people and we are exhibiting our game. We feel very proud and also nervous. And I find myself leaving my friends and venturing out into the crowd um, to go to the bathroom. And uh, as I look around, I suddenly realize that I find myself surrounded by a sea of dudes in suits. <clears throat> no women as far as the eye uh, could reach. And uh, this was a bit of a strange feeling for me. It's, it's, it's a bit hard to describe. Uh, imagine uh, picturing yourself in a sea of, of women or a sea, a sea of men or whatever, uh, whatever it is. And it made me feel uh, slightly... Um, um, well, not exactly like I fit in, at least. <laughs> this uh, picture is actually cheating because it's taken way later and this has changed quite a lot uh, from the last couple of years. So it, it did not look like this. Picture men in suits, but sort of this, uh, this amount of people surrounding you. Um, so I go through the crowd and I, I finally find a bathroom and the bathroom looks like this. <laughs> This is the men's queue, and this is the women's queue. And uh, I thought to myself, great. No line for me, I'm just gonna saunter by. And I entered this shiny, nice bathroom. Um, it's kind of strange to describe a bathroom as shiny and nice, but it was. It was very clean and very nice, very, very empty. Uh, except for a woman, uh, a really beautiful woman with big blue hair standing in front of the mirror. And at first I was in awe because she was so pretty and really hot. Uh, but then she turns to me with this sort of desperate look in her eyes and says, can you please help me? My boob keep falling out. I can't wear this. I'm not sure how to deal with this. She was wearing this sort of um, really, really tiny clothing. There's nothing wrong with tiny clothing, by the way, but this lady was obviously in distress. She was a booth babe and she was getting ready to go back out on the exhibition floor, but she couldn't because she was so uncomfortable by the way she was dressed and people trying to grab her and stuff like that. Um, so I, of course, came to her aid with a safety pin and some tape. We made a boob stick inside the dress, etc. I sent her off and, and that was that, basically. But this, this first step out into the conference made me think. It made me feel a little bit strange. It was this creeping feeling coming up on me. And everybody that I spoke to uh, took for granted that I was actually not a developer, but because I was a woman, I, I of, of course worked in marketing or something similar <clears throat> or accounting or something like that. Um, nothing wrong with that either, by the way. But, um, it was, um, it was a bit weird, 
and a bit sad. You go to these parties when there's a lot of guys and you have Bob Bates sitting in a corner drunk saying, I really want to meet girls. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you don't really know exactly what to do with yourself. <laughs> That's kind of how I felt. I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing here? Have I chosen the right career path? This was not exactly what I suspected. Uh, so I found myself asking a couple of questions. I thought to myself, ah, uh, why is it like this? Does it have to be like this? Can we do something about it? I asked the people around me and the unison answer was no. Why are you being so obnoxious bringing up these things? Games are supposed to be about fun and uh, this thing that you're talking about is not fun and uh, we don't want to talk about this anymore. I'm obviously summarizing. But that was the gist of it. Uh, okay, I thought, um, let's, uh, let's continue with the conference. And we look through the conference program and there is the session called Games for Girls, uh, within brackets, women. And I thought to myself, maybe this is something for us. So me and my friends um, went to this session, we entered this room, it's full of dudes, uh, I, I really like dudes, by the way. It's, it's, it's not that it's, it's something wrong with dudes, but the, the room is full of them. Uh, and in the front of the stage, there's this lady with iron gray hair. She was a German, uh, slightly elderly lady, uh, lecturing, uh, talking about what it's like to make games for women. And uh, the dudes were taking notes, very, very, uh, everything she said, because there's an untapped market, et cetera, et cetera, it's very important. And basically what she said that us women, after a days of work, when we come home and we have taken care of the kids and cooked dinner and cleaned, we deserve to sit down and play some games. There was a resounding yes from the audience. Games about uh, cooking. <laughs> games about cleaning. And games about taking care of kids. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my friends were, of course, slightly confused about this. We stood up and we said, uh, we're not sure we agree. Um, we play a lot of games. and." Uh, we don't really feel like this, this has anything to do uh, with us and what we do. Of course, if people want to play these kind of games, they should, but we can't relate to this. And the lady looked at us in confusion and said decidedly that, uh, well, but this is not for, for women like you. You're not normal women. <laughs> this is for a different kind of woman. <clears throat> okay, we thought, and we actually stood up and, and, and went out because we felt that there's not a lot for us to do here, actually. <laughs> um, so, so, so we thought we would find a place where we fit in a little bit more, but we actually didn't. It felt uh, a little bit less like we fit in. Somebody actually told us that this is not for you, this is for somebody else. <clears throat> uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, I am uh, for all sorts of games. The more the better, the more diversity the better. I have to drink a little bit. And this presentation is not to be supposed to be only about women in games. Uh, because, but, but obviously I am uh, a woman and I'm telling you about the kind of experiences that I have had. Um, so, so yeah, uh, there's nothing wrong with, with uh, these kind of games and etc. But on the other hand, uh, there are some problems. And there are things to work on uh, in this regard. I uh, have uh, been in many different situations. For example, where uh, we were making um, the character models for a game. Uh, that was supposed to be for the character creation screen. And you go along the room and you walk and you look at the people that do the 3D modeling and you see that the guys that are modeling the... <coughs> they were dudes. Uh, the, the, the guys that were modeling the, the characters, they were using these pictures of uh, 
porn stars uh, naked and nude to, to model the women. This is a true story. <laughs> this is true. They model everything in the tiniest detail, you know, like the nipples and everything. Uh, and and um, in the slightest detail. And then they were <laughs> you took a look at the, 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 the male models and they looked like can uh, figures, uh, nothing and nothing. And uh, it, it was really, really strange. And <laughs> we had to tell them that, guys, this, this is not going to work out. This is embarrassing. We need to do something about this. And, um, and we did, actually. And it's not always that hard to do something about this stuff. Um, another example of another studio, uh, when they were releasing a game called Mountain Blade, uh, somebody in the PR session and meeting said, hey guys, can't we put a woman on the cover this time? And the other people in the room goes, well, yeah, we never thought about that. Sure, we can do that. And I think that's an example of how Diversity plays a part where people who are different can bring b different perspectives and they can compensate for blind spots that you have. Uh, blind spots that you have due to your background and your own experience and you complement each other to create something that is more diverse, better, more interesting. Um, Mountain Blade was released in its original copy uh, with a woman on the cover. Uh, I think in Germany they actually removed it and uh, put the ma man on the cover because they felt, of course, this, this uh, can't sell, we can't have a woman on the cover, etc. Anyone who knows about Mountain Blade knows that it's a pretty popular game or a pretty successful title. Uh, so you know that it has sold anyways. And I think it's pretty common also to underestimate, underestimate uh, the gaming audience in general because even if you are somebody that in some ways contribute to uh, bigotry or, or sexism or whatever it is, I still don't think that you, it's not very likely that you're actually going to react that much just because there's a cover with a woman on your game. You're just going to buy the game because you want a game that is good and that you enjoy playing. Um, so I think it's really common to, to underestimate your audience. When it comes to being inclusive, and the opposite of being inclusive. For people who are uh, representative, representing a minority, it often feels like an invisible brick wall. I'm sorry, I'm really thirsty. For people who belong to a minority, uh, they're... Uh, sense of being excluded or not included, uh, like I felt slightly on the first conference that I visited, is a bit like an invisible brick wall. If you're not in that position, it's very likely that you're not going to be aware that this wall exists. And you're not going to understand that it might be frustrating for somebody, or hard, or that it's a bit more uphill to climb over this wall each time you want to take part in something. You keep running into this wall over and over and after a while you might even get annoyed. Some people get angry and frustrated and the people on the other side of the wall they just don't understand. They feel like why are you being so abrasive? Why are you being annoyed? Why are you acting like this? There's, there's no problem here. There, there's no brick wall, we don't know what you're talking about. Just come over and join us. Because you're blind to the predicament of being in that situation, which is pretty normal. And that is how uh, I'm gonna move over from talking only about me to actually talking about the RC, which is the organization that I am working for. <clears throat> so what about the RC? What is it? How does it get started? What is it about? We will uh, fast forward from 2007 to 2014, 2013, actually. When again, uh, it's, it's quite a few years later, um, people stand up and say, can we do something about it? There seems to be an issue here with inclusivity sometimes in some regards. Is it something that we can work on? Do we need to be more diverse? And the answer is, yeah. Probably, yeah, 
we can try. We can do something about it. Uh, and that is how the pre-study for the diversity initiative was started. Um, by a research company called Praxicom and the Swedish games industry, um, 2013. Then in 2014, something else happens. Uh, Gamergate happens. And Gamergate is not something that we usually talk that much about in diversity, actually. <coughs> but a result of of the Gamergate phenomena was that for some people the invisible brick wall is not so invisible anymore. And that also led to a snowball reaction where more people find themselves wanting to learn about diversity, wanting to, to work for a more inclusive uh, gaming sphere. And so diversity was founded. So I want to I wanna stress that diversity was thought of before, <laughs> way before uh, Gamergate, so it's not the response to that. It's just, um, I think it piqued people's interest in the organization a little bit. Um, so what is Diversity? It's a non-profit organization, first of all. We work as a collective force for greater uh, diversity within the games industry, but also within educational institutions and in communities. Our goal is to enable people from all these different sectors to come together in a network, exchange ideas and thoughts, talk about this is how we do it, how do you do it, this is how we moderate our forums, oh, we can learn something from that, this is how we deal with recruitment, etc. The idea is that more people should feel welcome to all these sectors, as I said, I'm repeating myself, um, increase talent pool for the industry. Uh, more innovative games for a broader spectrum of players. We uh, work with positive reinforcement. Uh, there is a point to talking about the things that are not working, but we mostly focus on stuff that we feel are good. Here we have somebody that is working in a really effective way at their company with diversity, so why not highlight them? Show other people that this is a way that you can do it. Sharing knowledge, pooling knowledge, and showing a way to move forward. And it's not about excluding things, it's about adding more to choose from. That is the whole point. Since we talk so much about diversity, I'm starting to grow tired of this word almost. Oh, it's becoming some kind of mantra. I thought I should mention also what we think of when we talk about diversity. I have talked a lot about women in games, but it's definitely not only about that. We usually talk about gender, sexuality, ethnicity, physical and cognitive impairments. But also things like body image and age. Of course, when I am 95 years old, I still want to be able to play World of Warcraft. I might have a limited sphere of things available to me to do, so I'm planning ahead. <laughs> Give us this background. A pre study was made in 2013, was funded by Vinova. Uh, surrounding world analysis was made, and what they found out was the following that uh, initiatives for diversity already exist, but there's very little communication in between them, which slows down progress. And it only, they usually only focused on one aspect of the gaming sphere, whereas the receipt focuses on, as I said, education, industry, and community. And uh, yeah, I think I'm already, I'm, I'm repeating myself slightly here. Let's go move onwards. Purpose and need. So uh, why is, is the receipt needed then? When it comes to the industry, uh, the general consensus, at least in Sweden, is that we need a broadened talent pool to recruit from. And it needs unique ideas to keep staying innovative, which equals profit as well for a lot of companies. And it needs to keep up with its customers. She's so cute. 
Love that pick. When it comes to the educational institutions, they are bringing up the developers of tomorrow. Some of which are probably sitting here right now. Maybe all of you. They need a way to tackle these questions. Gamers need a ballet to run. Uh, uh, <sighs> it's all about entertainment. A banner to rally behind. That's uh, what, uh, what it's about. And that's why we're also supportive by and working with organizations such as Stockholm eSport, Malmö eSport, and um, Sverok. This is Pac Manhattan. Awesome game. Very um, energy draining. <laughs> this is Manhattan where they're running. You probably figured that out. So what do we do then? And how are we organized? We have um, a board that uh, takes all the big um, decisions. We have people from the both, both big and small developer companies in our board. And uh, people from um, educations as well such as Marcus, for example, <laughs> our newest board member. Um, we have an operations uh, section at Kansli uh, that I am in charge of, that uh, handles the practical running of the organization. Uh, a lot of people come to us and say, hey, we need this, can you help us? We need to find somebody so-and-so with a different uh, ethnical background that can come and lecture. Can you help us find somebody, please? We do a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, we also have task groups. Uh, we're starting a task group this week because we're going to the GDC and sponsoring people to go there. Um, and um, so the task groups are involved with specific projects that we do. And we always need people. Then we have the local groups uh, around uh, Sweden. And um, this has been a really, really slow process for us. At the moment, we have managed to actually start up a proper uh, local chapter in Malmö, Skövde, and Gothenburg, and somewhat in Stockholm, but our board is there and our operations is there, so it's a bit... Mm. Um, but we would like to start up one here, for example, and um, also in Umeå uh, as well. Our activities consist of uh, several different things. Uh, we have meetups where we network and such. Um, at the Nordic Game, we had a big uh, presence uh, this year. It was really, really fun. We had a panel. Uh, we had students, female students, that we sponsored to go there. Uh, we had a big mixer where people gathered to talk and etc. It's a lot of good networking opportunities. <coughs> We also provide um, advice and code of conduct. I don't know if you've heard about it, but uh, we have just, together with a couple of other organizations such as DreamHack and Sverok, etc., uh, released a official uh, Swedish code of conduct for esports. Is there anybody that's heard about this? A couple of you have. Okay, yeah. We were part of doing that thing. <laughs> I should sleep more. <laughs> <laughs> My vocabulary is shrinking by the minute. These are some pictures from Nordic Game. This is our panel. A uh, lot of awesome people there. Uh, it's a bit hard to see. <laughs> this is uh, Rami Ismail, uh, Osa Rus, uh, Anne Sophie Sydow, Johanna Nylander, and Annika Fogelgren. And they are not talking about diversity so much as they are talking about the future of the games industry. And uh, for us it's important to work with representation, so we try to make sure that different voices get heard at in this industry event and such. So, for example, um, there are an unusual amount of women in this panel actually, probably the only one. <laughs> Um, and, um, and the whole point is that they don't have to talk about women in games just because they're women. They talk about their profession and what they actually do. Uh, Rami also had some really excellent points uh, when he was 
with us. Uh, he's a really, really uh, great guy, an uh, indie developer from the Netherlands. And he talked about, for example, how he would like to see a future where there is a man with a beard with middle, from with Middle Eastern uh, descent who is not only in the game to get shot and blown to pieces, but actually to do something useful and nice for once. <clears throat> we also do events that are not industry events. This is what we did at the We Are Stockholm uh, event this year at the festival. We had a big uh, Heroes of the Storm tournament. Uh, there is some people from Stockholm Esport. I think a sweet studio is there and there's also Queenie leading there. Uh, does anybody know of Queenie? She's a StarCraft uh, pro from Sweden. You can read about us on the web. We have a big uh, support from a lot of different uh, organizations, as you can see. You can check out our website and read more about us. You can also read about uh, how the different companies that we cooperate with and organizations actually work with diversity and why they think it's important. And. Um, you can read a bit about what we're doing. You can, of course, contact us as well with feedback, um, positive and negative. We will listen. You can ask questions as well. We have Twitter. This is Twitter, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> I do not manage our Twitter account. We have a Twitter. We have a Facebook. You should go and like it. This is uh, an order, by the way. It's not negotiable. And um, what else do we do? Yes, we have the local groups. Here are uh, some pictures from our first meetup. And uh, people wrote down what they wanted to do. The, the local groups are very, very free, actually. It's, um, it's the, the region, the re people in the region itself that decides what they want to do. It can be anything from arranging a series of lectures on um, unconscious bias or game accessibility, how to make games for somebody with a physical impairment, um, to hosting a game jam. Uh, it's, it's really up to the local group. Um, we would really, really want to have a chapter in VSP if it's possible. And if you are interested, you should contact me. I live in VSP right now. Uh, probably not for much longer, but at the moment I'm here. And uh, above all, there is a network, so spread the word. Uh, you can join us, show yourself in your organization if you want to. And uh, that's about all I had to talk about today, actually. Am I on time? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do we have time for questions? Plenty. Oh, really? Yeah. Was I fast? Huh. I didn't expect that. Okay. Do you have any questions? Blue t-shirt. Uh, you spoke a little bit about the project you did in 2007. Yeah. The, uh, for what was, what's now called GDC. Uh, but I don't think you actually mentioned what it was about or... Uh, yeah, what? Yeah, what you've been working on. <laughs> it was a story about an ump. A what? An ump. Uh, it was an. It repeat the question. <laughs> but should. Please, yeah, please repeat the question. Oh, right. I should. Re okay. Um, I didn't understand before. I understand that. Uh, the question was. Uh, what kind of project was I actually working on in 2007? It was an adventure game called Fairy Tale, a side scroller uh, 2D adventure game uh, for kids. The main character was an ump. Umps are forest people that live in the forest and take care of the forest. They are very cute. They've got long ears. Does this answer your question? It does. Okay. Anybody else? Me. Oh, there. <laughs> Uh, wonderful talk. Uh, as someone who is constantly working with uh, diversity in a card game, mm -hmm. representing uh, all kinds of races, ages, and uh, the qualities and such, I have encountered a lot of extremists when working on it, both for the good and for the bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, certain members in the group have felt well uncomfortable when meeting these extremists. Yeah. And I wanted to ask on both on a personal level, 
how to handle this and what can diversity and what is diversity uh, diversity's thoughts about extremists in general okay that was a very long question uh, so uh, mr uh, orange shirt <laughs> That makes me think about Half-Life. Uh, is wondering how, when working on a game where you try to take diversity seriously and include in your product, in your game, how you actually deal with opposition and people that question you and actually go pretty far, uh, as far as maybe harassing you um, because of the things that you do. So how can you deal with that? What is DVC's role when it comes to things like that? I would say that does DVC work a lot for, for with positive reinforcement? Um, what we do when it comes to like what we do on an organizational level is do things like try to to talk about uh, these problems and work for change by, for example, making the code of conduct. Uh, we also cooperate with organizations such as Game Over Hate, for example. Um, on an individual level, I think as a group, I would advise for one to not let yourself be singled out easily if you are a group. Always show yourself as a group because it's a lot harder to know who to attack if it's a group of people. Uh, so that you don't have like one front person uh, because then that person is going to get targeted. There are also a lot of help available online nowadays, created by people that have been harassed. Uh, there is one in particular uh, that Zoe Quinn has started, uh, called Crash Overdrive, uh, where they talk about these issues and how you can handle them. So I think for DRC, uh, what you could do is, is come to us and ask us for advice. We might not have all the answers, but we can put you in contact with somebody that might have the answers. And it might also feel reassuring to hang out with people and talk to people that feel the same and that are not um, aggressive and <laughs> trying to harass you, but actually understand you. Because the, the unity makes you feel stronger and that usually makes it easier to, to handle these kind of things as well. Does that answer your question? Long answer for a long question. Yeah, exactly. Do we have any more questions? There, I see you as well, but her first. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you come involved in different projects like uh, Evil Line or Diversity? Well, for Eve, I was headhunted. Um, partially because I've been going to a lot of conferences. Partially because I went to a nice education, a nice school that sent me places. So uh, my time here helped me get a job, definitely, because it enabled me to uh, find contacts and, and uh, understand why networking is important. And networking, above all, is the one thing that is going to give you a, a job. Uh, a really good portfolio can as well, but networking is really, really important. Listening to people, treating everybody that you meet nicely and with respect, because you never know where they're going to end up in two years. So be nice is, is a good advice, I think. Um, so for Eva, I was headhunted and contacted by them. And um, when it comes to diversity, uh, I had friends that was a part of starting it and they needed a project manager and they knew that I had the background both um, with Seeds of Learning, both had been working, working in the industry and also very involved with gaming communities. I, I run a gaming community myself that works a lot with, um, that has a very strong non-bigotry policy for example. We worked for several years trying to build up our community. So it's something that like taking charge of the environment that you exist within and play in is something that has been a part of my life a lot. And that's been really important to me. For example, uh, I remember when we started our gaming community, we said, well, why should we let anonymity be an excuse for having people treat each other like crap? We don't want that. And instead of just 
complaining about it, let's do something about it. Let's make our, create our own community where we set up the rules and that we may, where we make sure that people who join us understand why this is important. And it's, it's worked really well. We have people sometimes that join us be because they really want to join us <laughs> and they don't get the point. But then after a couple of, of a months, they come to me and say things like, I understand now. This is a lot nicer. I feel more focused, I feel more productive, I win more often, <laughs> etc. So um, I've been very involved with all these three and I think that's why they wanted to, to get me into the organization as well. I forgot to repeat the question, didn't I? I think I did. The question was how I got involved with all this stuff that I've been doing, basically, yeah. And there, yeah, hi. If you were to start a local group here in these three, what kind of things uh, would you do? I think that's up to the people who are here. Um, I would suggest uh, contacting me and, um, and talk about it. And if the people who are here don't feel sure about what they want to do, I or we would come with suggestions. So we have a couple of uh, examples and we have examples of what other um, local groups have done. But it's, it's a lot up to the group itself. So I would say at first, gather people, see what people are interested in, what they are passionate about, what they would like to do, what would be helpful, both from a diversity perspective, but maybe also from a networking and, and career pr perspective. Um, discuss that, pick up the ideas, and then if something is lacking, we can add ideas to that. And the question was, what would you do if you <laughs> would to start a, a local group here in Visby? I should try and do that in the, the other way around. Yeah, <laughs> getting it backwards. Um, anybody else? No questions? Oh, there, hi. Hmm. Thank you, Hakan. <laughs> uh, there has been some talk about creating like a Bechdel test or a stamp of approval for games. What do I think about that? So I can tell you that I have the inside scoop on this story. Not a lot of people do. <laughs> uh, when this started to get talked about, people for one thought it, it was a DRC initiative, which it wasn't. It was an initiative for the Swedish games industry. We got completely swamped with uh, phone calls. The Fox News called and said, hey, we heard that you in Sweden are going to make a sexist label for games. So what do you have to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and we were trying to react to this in a <laughs> reasonable fashion, but uh, you know, Fox News. <laughs> scary, scary stuff. Um, I, the, initi the initiative for a stamp of approval, as it was first formulated, was first of all, it, it was formulated as a pre-study where there would be research done to see if there was a need. So that was the project. Uh, is there a need for a uh, norm critical labeling uh, for games? And it would be a positive labeling where you put uh, almost like, a, you know, when you have like organic food and you put the organic seal stamp on. So um, it would be like an AOK -okay stamp. Uh, it would not be like, ban this, this is bad, this is the sexist label. <laughs> <laughs> Don't buy this game. Nothing like that at all. Um, so that was the idea from the start. And, and to be honest, um, personally, it's not something that I would mind. It might be nice in order to give more attention to some titles that um, could serve to help people understand how you can work with diversity in your games. Um, some parents might enjoy it as well, maybe. But I think it's really hard to answer before an actual pre-study has been made. For me, it's, it's important that there is a need before you initiate a project. And the idea was to, to research first and see what the need actually looked like. And we never got an answer to that. Did you want to say something else? 
Yeah, a bit like uh, the carrot and the stick, or the hen and the egg. Or the, um, the project, uh, she's wondering if it's still in a research phase. Uh, the project hasn't actually been initiated. The project is in a, a fund searching uh, period. And uh, there are quite, it's quite a lot of money, so it takes time. And there are long waiting periods and such for it. So we don't know yet what's going to happen to it. Uh, it might happen, uh, it might not happen. So now everybody know what that actually was about. It's been a lot of strange uh, talk about this that is completely incorrect. Does that answer your question? Okay. Anybody else? Nobody? You look like you almost want to ask something. No, you clap. <laughs> oh, you want to get out of here? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm done, so. Go ahead. Feel free to email me uh, if you have questions about anything. I'm really good at knitting. Vi tar ett till avbrott för lite syre.